All right. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Love and Heartbreak, Real Estate Unfiltered. Uh, we're here from the West Coast and virtually with Terry Sprague. So thank you so much for joining us, Terry. Uh, Terry is the owner and broker of Lux uh, with Forbes Global Properties uh, out in Oregon. He is the top producing agent in Oregon, named by Inman's Real Trends and the Wall Street Journal. Uh, I know, you know, just from my experience with him, he represents some really cool new development out there. He's done some amazing things. We were talking before this. You've done an amazing job, Terry, at staying calm through the chaos. And I know you're a big, which I think you're going to hit on that surprise and delight. And I'm I'm really looking forward to you surprising and delighting us in the audience here today. So I'd love to maybe just take us back because I know you've had a career before real estate. So, you know, tell us a little bit about you and how you got, you know, you maybe got here first. So, you know, one of the benefits, I think, of being, I don't know, a senior broker uh, that has had past careers. And I know that this industry, there's no barrier to entry. So we can all come in from different directions. Um, I had three career, a couple of different careers that I think helped me prepare for being in real estate. Um, one of my first careers was I went through executive training with uh, Myron Franks, which is now owned by Macy's. As a young person, I was 18 years old and had given McDonald's gift certificates to the management at Myron Franks. And uh, they decided to put me through the college recruitment program, uh, although I was only 18. And I became an executive at a really young age and went into management in retail and then worked for a very high end fashion company uh, and ultimately became a clothing buyer and was flying around to Magic and Nansby in my early 20s buying men's Italian clothing. And then a buddy of mine called me from New York and said, hey, you should come work at Lehman Brothers. So uh I went to work. I, I flew back east and I interviewed. I only had one year of college. I was not, I have learning differences. And so academically didn't do really great, but I took one year of college where uh, I took small group, large group, interpersonal persuasive speaking classes, and then had a blast and then got recruited to a buying position in Hawaii. When I went out and interviewed at that time, it was on the retail side, Sherson Lehman Hutton to date myself. And uh, when I interviewed, the guy said, where'd you go to college? I said, I went to the University of Oregon. He said, when'd you graduate? I said, I finished in 1982. Um, so I'm part of a new alumni of people who finished college after one year. And um, But I was rookie of the year at, at the company. And it came down to, I, I didn't come from a family that had a, a fraternity of, of wealth. I ended up getting on the phone and and I created what was called the Century Club. Club. I, I cold called uh, and 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 pitched 100 people a day, um, and you know back then it was a, a different marketplace where I could go to the market maker and and pick up blocks of stock or blocks of uh, of bonds and discount them and have a very successful um, cold calling. But one of the dynamics that stuck with me from that career was I was walking by an office of a, a producer that had been in business for a long time, and I heard him say. I have a $50,000 minimum. So now remember this is in the eighties. So that'd be like saying I have a quarter million dollar minimum now. And I thought, why do I have to wait to have a $50,000 minimum, even though I've only been in the business for about a week. And so every time that I would speak to somebody and they'd say, yeah, you know, I'll take some of those bonds or that stock. I'd say, wait, I have a $50,000 minimum. And if they said they had less, I'd say, why don't we do this? Why don't I call you back when you have, um, more assets coming um, available, and then I'll see if we have a good idea at that time. So in my mind, I decided, why should I wait to make the higher commission? Why should I wait 15 years to get his commission? <clears throat> why don't I just start doing it now? And by doing that, I started opening like three accounts a day at $50,000. Now, in the real, then what happened was I, I did that career for, uh, 15 years till till 99, and and quite honestly, I was the um, the ultimate 80s 90s guys that rolled hard, made a lot of money, and 
if I made a half a million, I spent 600,000 and I lived life to the fullest. I mean, I looked up to Hunter S. Thompson and uh, Hemingway. So I lived life to the fullest. But I, 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 had, I was working as a vice president up in Seattle at the time. I went through a Jerry Maguire moment. I was kind of burning out. And um, that turned into me deciding to take a break from my career. And I bought a one-way ticket to Antigua uh, in the Caribbean. And I sold everything and uh, I started doing some artwork and I came up with a digital art idea that before all the digital apps and uh, the Nordstrom Gallery up in Seattle had me do a first Thursday, I became an artist <laughs> overnight. And then when I moved to the Caribbean, I found a 10 acre estate that um, I went to the government of Antigua and I said, you know, all the local artists have... Um, sell their art on the streets. What if I took this uh, 10 acre estate and we made this 280 degree living room into an art gallery uh, that, that with a view of the ocean in Montserrat. And then we get a local family to do barbecue in the backyard. And then uh, it became a very popular place called Heavenly Hill. If you Googled it, you'd see a story about a guy with a, a, a an art gallery in Antigua. And then I just basically did cross Atlantic sailing and fishing every day for six years. And then one day uh, uh, my wife rolled up in a taxi at a little beach restaurant that I'd go to at night and hang out. And I heard an, uh, an American accent and fell in love uh, on the beach. And uh, before I knew it, she called me from Puerto Rico and said, Hey, I liked you. I ended up going back and forth to New York and we got married came back to visit my mom and dad who were living here in Portland and my mom was dying. And I thought, okay, it's time for me to rejoin the world. So I bought a house. And while I was buying a house, I was like, what do these guys do? You know, like, where is the merchandising? Where is the marketing that I was used to doing when it came to fine detail merchandising of a high-end clothing store? Where is the financial advice? Where is the peer-to-peer uh, trust of giving someone advice to make large financial decisions. And where's that business acclimate that um, someone would want, like I would want if I was doing a transaction. So j literally out of curiosity, I sat down and I wrote a business plan of what I would, how I would recreate the real estate model. And then I presented that business plan to a local uh, really great company called Windermere and they said, well, gosh, we've never seen a business plan before. Uh, and do you really think you could do this? And in one year, I became the number one producer at that company. And then I've had a great career, but I've got two, two daughters, uh, you know, that are high school students. And um, right now, I'm just kind of trying to be sure that I deliver a good life for them and happen to have found a good little niche in the business yeah, and you've uh, you've juggled quite a bit. I I guess you know one of my first questions is, you know, you mentioned there was this strong desire, and you realized the need to apply some of the merchandising skills, the business skills, and things like that to the real estate side of things. What are what are some specific examples or projects where you came in and you you know you executed X and then sure. saw some you know really big difference in the uh, you know in the projects there. So I was starting in like 07, just coming out of the Armalist book. And and I remember the first thing I looked at was the imagery um, that, uh, you know, people just took really poor pictures back then. And um, I I found it and I, and I had done some professional photography as an artist and actually shot some of my own houses to begin with. And I found an incredible photographer that I said, this is back before the, the the software was built into the cameras to do the layered imagery. You had to Photoshop in the interior and the exterior of the window in order to get the the real the eyes view of the house. But I found a great photographer and I said, look, I'll pay you more than any other broker, but I want my imagery to look like it could be published on in Architectural Digest magazine. Then I got an eight million dollar listing and um the at the time drones really hadn't been used and there was one company out of australia called golden eye and at that time i had moved to christie's and 
loved the concept of Christie's and, and comparing art to selling real estate. That's the whole storytelling part of it. I also hired writers. So um, I don't write I, my learning differences. I don't I I have someone else write the story and interview the client. And, um, you know, while I'll publish a, a small story online, people love to read the story about the house. And then when it came to uh, that eight million dollar house, I, I searched and I found a, a marketing company that did video for Nike and did really cool ads. And I said, I want to do a beautiful video about a house. And um, so I spent fifteen thousand dollars in 07 money or or I guess that was maybe that one was like 2013. Um, but that was a lot of money at the time. And we did this beautiful production, which included there was a TV show being shot here in Portland called Grimm. And we used actors and actresses from the TV show. We had, you know, what has become normal now, the car driving in, beautiful people getting out of the car, putting them into the boat, driving them around the lake. And we had the drone. We had to practically duct tape a, a camera to a drone and to find a pilot that actually knew how to chase it. You know, this is before the software would do it for yourself. And I sent that video into Christie's and they said, Terry, this is like groundbreaking. Would you like to play this video at our international meeting? And I think it was in London or France. And so, you know, there at the, uh, the, the big meeting on the big screen was my movie of this house. And that's back when you would shoot a four minute movie. Um, but it, at the time, other than like golden eye, it was one of the first times that even the owners of Christie's had seen that type of production. And, um, you know, that was kind of groundbreaking at, at the time. And that year, Christie's voted my little company, little bonsai tree, as company of the year in the world. And um, that kind of began, um, you know, part of the process of sharing good ideas with other brokers. I love that. I love that. And that's like, I mean, you've always like really brought uh, some really great, you know, entertainment value, I think is what that, you know, comes down to too, to the business. And you're trying to push the boundaries of like really new things. And it's amazing how much that can just catch on fire. And so quickly when you're pushing to, uh, you know, to, to I think, do that. Um, are there instances, like I'm sure you've tried a lot, maybe in past careers or, you know, even in this where, like, hey, you know, I, I only know these types of things are going to work because I fell flat on my face or I, I really learned from, you know, this mistake or this thing didn't go so well on, you know, on this property. Is there an example maybe of uh, something, you know, like that and maybe entertainment value or not? So, you know, I think um, if you use common sense and good taste, um I don't think you can try enough ideas. I think, you know, you've heard the 212 theory that, you know, the one degree of difference theory. I'm always searching for the one degree. One of the questions that, you know, a friend of mine and I, Kendra Ratcliffe, discussed one day was, um, and I'm sure we didn't come up with the original quote, but, you know, if you were, everybody talks about disruption. If you were trying to put your own self out of business today, I want... Ben is going to try to put himself out of business. If somebody was competing with me in a listing presentation, if, if they knew everything that I knew, what things could they do to put me out of business? So I'm always asking myself, what would I do to put me out of business? So rather than waiting for the disruption, let me be the market leader and let me disrupt the rest of the industry. And so it's 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 a, an amazing uh, activity because what was, um, you know, groundbreaking at one time when I started in the industry has become more of a commoditized, you know, video photography, social media. Um, you know, there's more and more people joining that game and doing it incredibly well. Um, so I'm always searching for what can I do that the other competition's not going to do? And that's really important, too, to not look at your competition as a, oh, I don't like that guy or I don't like that guy. But, hey, if they're successful, what best practices are they doing that are succeeding for them? How can I um, go ahead and emulate their best practices 
and then create my best practices. So when, uh, like for instance, when I'm interviewing and someone will ask me about a competing broker, I'm always complimentary. You know, it's always like, hey, I looked up to Ben when I got into the industry and I've tried to emulate him. And what I've also tried to do is come up with things that I think will help my clients to maximize the event and enjoy the event of working with me. Yeah. What do you, you know, we were talking, you know, before this kicked off as well about some of the chaos and disruption and obviously like our industry is dealing with, uh, you know, quite a bit of that, uh, you know, these days on some of the the national, you know, news level fronts. But I, I don't think, you know, to your point, that's necessarily, you know, anything new. Um, what are some of like the major, major disruptions or things like you didn't really, you know, expect throughout your career? Is there, you know, is it a particular deal or client or HR or is it, you know, things that are going on in the industry? So what what have some of those been for you? You know, I'm I'm pretty mellow when it comes to, you know, when something comes up that's difficult, um, I tend to suggest to everybody to, to pause and take a break. And, you know, I'm all about writing a, an extension to a deadline and letting all parties think about it. You know, you got to remember when you go into a real estate transaction, the buyer's purpose when they wrote that offer was to buy that property. The seller's purpose was to sell that property. Sometimes throughout the transactions, people get distracted, whether it be the inspection contingencies or certain things that come up. I think it's, uh, you know, looking back on your past transactions and thinking about how many did you keep together? You know, what's your closing rate of what you put together? Because you helped everybody manage the emotions, um, keep it a business transaction. Sometimes as complicated as contracts are getting, I wish we could just go back to a napkin because if you can remember and remind buyer and seller that your purpose was to buy this, your purpose was to sell this, let's not let this small percentage of, of uh, change or negotiation distract you from the, um, the, the opportunity cost of not putting this deal together. So, um, you know, it's been one big, to me, the the economy, the um, the experiment of a lot of things in society and uh, um, economically have been, you know, this has been a very interesting couple of years. Uh, I used to be a cycle trader. So I used to try to forecast cycles and then buy things as a contrarian that were out of favor in advance. Um, you know, this has been a really confusing cycle for me because so many, so much of what's going on that affects consumer confidence um, is shifting so quickly. People have access to information and ideas and opinions faster than ever. And then, you know, the, the new stuff we're going out that's coming out with the NAR, I think it's a nothing burger. I think it's like almost on the on the edge of ridiculous. Uh, you know, I, I I don't know if you remember when self-checkout became the thing at the grocery store. I was just reading an article and I remember like, oh, I got to go through self-checkout. And then I'm like, oh, okay, I can figure this out. I just weighing my vegetables was curious. Uh, um, but I was reading an article yesterday that a lot of retailers are moving away from self-checkout back to traditional checkout because they can't even manage that transaction without loss of, of revenue and customer experience. And so imagine trying to basically suggest that, hey, we're going to change the world of real estate to self-checkout. What a great idea. I mean, seriously, um, I don't think we have anything to worry about. I think it's <laughs> That's such a great analogy. I'm picturing, you know, just all the people, the, usually the line that self-checkout are so much longer than the uh, than the regular checkout. I personally love like Trader Joe's or all these and things like that. It's just so efficient. Just boom, boom, boom. The movie, you yeah. the cashier, uh, you know, cashier line. Are there, I mean, you have, and, and then I have a, a few questions I kind of always like to to wrap up with, but I feel like there's some, you know, any specific stories that were good learning experiences for you. You mentioned, you know, it, it sounds like you were living life in the fast lane or maybe into oncoming traffic, you know, going a hundred miles an hour back in the, um, you know, the trading days or, um, you know, a, a specific, you know, client that, you know, struck you as very just, you know, I know you're big on relationships. So uh, maybe particularly interesting or funny that uh, you ended up learning from. So is there is there anything that, you know, strikes you from your career that was like, 
you know, very impactful or entertaining on uh, on any of those levels. I feel like you got a lot of good stories underneath there. I have a lot of great stories. I mean, I work with, um, you know, all kinds of people. And, um, you know, the key is to be willing to adapt to, um, you know, their style initially, gain their trust, and then remember you're their advisor. And so, uh, you know, I've had stories where, uh, very powerful CFO CEOs um, that are used to basically walking out of boardrooms when they don't get their way. Um, I've had, uh, you know, the opportunity to advise them and uh, allow them to remember this is ultimately their decision, but the advice I'm giving you right now, don't confuse it for some sort of sales technique. This is really how I suggest you move forward. If you don't move forward in this moment with that idea, I'm imprinting it on you right now. Um, and I've had, you know, spouses say to me, Terry, you know, I love the way that you talk to, you've been able to manage who is normally a very difficult person to manage and they're taking your advice and those turned into great clients. Um, you know, I have all kinds of funny stories, but I have to be careful not to, uh, you know, go, I've had all kinds of faux pas of, selling houses of very wealthy people that didn't move out the right way and having to manage basically creating, moving out people out of their own houses for them at the last minute, uh, you know, weather situations. And, uh, you know, I, it's, I'm almost uncomfortable to go to, cause I don't want to profile a particular client. I've worked with the NBA, a lot of NBA stars and, um, you know, have had to navigate through, working with attorneys and um, handlers that manage those clients. Uh, I think the biggest thing is like patience and grace. One time I was doing a transaction that was a little over $20 million and, uh, and, and, and both buyer and seller asked me to manage both sides. And they were both lawyered up big time. And um, it was a little bit, uh, there was some complicated times that both parties became very emotional. And, um, but I, when I look back on that transaction, it could have imploded at any given point in time. If I would have um, kind of uh, leaned into and um, embraced their anxiety and their emotions. And uh, the key is, you know, somehow during those moments, finding the grace to slow everybody down and um, to let them know, remember the purpose here. The purpose is to get your house sold. And, um, you know, we can't control certain things, um, but if this is meant to close, it's going to close and I'm doing all I can. Um, no, you know, I have lots of funny stories, but I, so I, this I, is, I'm so careful this is, to share them. <laughs> I know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you one last press and then I'll let it go. Since this is real estate unfiltered, uh, we try and flush out some of those uh, stories here. Is there any one of those? Because I see you smiling. I feel like there's something in there uh, without giving too many, you know, or any context clues as to who the client, you know, is. And you could just even make up a false, you know, profession. But, you know, one of those things that that went on is there. I, I see like one or two at the tip of the year. <laughs> Well, I'd say, you know, one of the biggest faux pas was, I was selling a, I'll just call the, the person that was selling their house, a celebrity's home. And, um, and celebrities and or people that everything's always taken care of or just naturally goes their way. And, um, but maybe they forget some of their own personal responsibility of how they'd like to be treated. Um, I sold, and it was just dual agency too. I sold this property to my clients and they moved in and there was still a lot of stuff in the house. The guy didn't get out of the house. And my clients were patient with that because it was a eight or 9,000 square foot house. And it's just my clients, but it was like, yeah, the bedroom was fine. Kitchen was fine, but there was stuff everywhere, trophies and, and stuff. And um, one night at about midnight with, without anybody calling uh, basically some of his handlers showed up and knocked on the door and said, we're here to pick up his stuff. And I get a call, Terry, there's these people <laughs> <laughs> that was more like an entourage uh, <laughs> that are showing up at our house 
And I had to manage that at midnight and um, call the celebrity and say, hey, you know, this isn't cool. Uh, and 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 that yet I didn't want to mess up the relationship with him and his people. But uh, we, uh, you know, my my team, all hands were on deck. And the following day, we got everything figured out and cleaned up. Um, there's been, you know, there's been stories of probably the biggest stories have been people getting ready to move out. And I had one situation where the movers were deciding to literally at the time I came over that was supposed to be possession at five o'clock. And these guys are removing restoration hardware lighting from the ceiling. And um, I'm having to stop them from stealing all the stuff out of the house. Uh, but I handled it. Um, the, you know, it's a, I, I was joking uh, with you. It's, you have to embrace chaos. Um, and, uh, you know, to me, the funnest chaos is Disneyland, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you from one ride to the other. And there's, there's no etiquette of how you do that. And Disneyland thought about actually putting in traffic zones at one point in time. So for all these people that think, oh, balance and time frame balance, I think for me in this business, you got to be able to embrace that this is a, a seven day a week, 12 hour a day. Um, you signed up for it. Yeah, I, I love that. Those are those are some really uh, golden, you know, golden stories there. I just, the, you know, the, the look on my wife's face, uh, if people showed up at, you know, midnight from some <laughs> to, uh, to pick some things up, uh, you know, that would not be a pretty scene. So I'm just imagining that. God bless you for, you know, for being up. But I, I think we keep coming back to this calm and the chaos and you know and how you manage everything and how you do this and I, I usually wrap with folks with you know really two pieces of you know of advice I guess what is what's your most frequent advice you know when you first start talking with a new client on um, you know just advice on the process that really sets that up to really stay calm through the chaos that might you know ensue you know throughout so I went to an interview the other day. Um, it was uh, a proposal of taking on $14 million listing. And um, I was totally burnt out that morning. I really didn't even want to go. It. Um, I honestly, here's the funny story. I had to take a trip the night before. And so I didn't get have time to get home and change. So I'm wearing the clothes that I wore the day before. I mean, I'm thinking I'm showing up in the most unprepared situation. And uh, I showed up and they were lovely people and um, she made some muffins for me and we're talking. And um, I remembered there wasn't any pressure on God. Am I going to say the right things? Because uh, I don't really talk about myself a lot at, at an interview. I assume if they've called me or they know me, um, they, they've done that for a reason. So I spent the total two hours asking about why am I here? And, um, and and we dive deep into that. And um, they had had a previous broker. And so without throwing the other, other broker under the bus uh, as a tactic, I was really trying to identify what was it that, that you, you wanted in an experience or what previous experiences, what have been the best real estate experiences that you've had and, and how did they work out for you? And what were the things that um, you know weren't working for you and why are you selling and what are your timelines and uh, you know, how do you like to be communicated to? And uh, you know, and, and you know, sometimes it's literally saying, you know, like other than your priest, do me a favor and tell me everything because I don't want to know that you're getting a divorce a month later and I should have got this deal done. You know, what is the, you know, what is your pricing opinion? Are we pricing to the market, like back to the stocks? Are we, you know, if you bought a stock for a particular price and it's trading at a certain level, you can't just go trade it on another exchange hoping to get a different price. That's the market value. So are you prepared to sell at market value or and be the next house to sell in this space? Or are you looking for, you know, what people say, I'm in no hurry. I want the fruit to remain on the shelf and go, you know, and rot and go down in value anyway. So why am I here? Um, and I would say that's my number one thing is I I uh, I don't bring a CMA. 
I don't, I don't pre-value the property before I go see it. I want to be boots in the ground. I want to know why I'm here. And the more that I know of why they, why am I here, the more that I know how to answer why I think I'm the right person for them. Um, literally, you know, after that interview, I said, you know, why don't you interview some other brokers and look at some other models? I mean, that's the whole NAR thing that there wasn't, a, nobody knew how to physical their house before, I guess. Um, why don't you interview some other models and why don't you talk to some other brokers? And they said, no, Terry, you're it. We're hiring you. And then I said, well, you know, you haven't even asked, you know, what is my commission or my fees? And they said, what are they? And I said, I'm 1% more than everybody else. They said, that makes sense. Um, and then, you know, I called my people and started my process. I, I love that. And so I think it really comes down to, you know, the best advice is really unique to the client, you know, getting really clear on all the things that are important to them and all those categories you mentioned to really be able to properly advise, have proper strategy, do all the things you mentioned from, you know, merchandising, you know, all of and that. And don't feel scared to put expectations on them. I mean, you are going into a business relationship with them. And if I'm going into business with you, whatever industry it is, I want to have a good business partner. So you also need to let them know what your expectations are as their business partner. And that if you're going to be my business partner, here are my expectations of how you're going to communicate with me, what you're going to do to prepare your house. Uh, and, and, if, and if that's too invasive and it sounds too, too planned to work with me, then you should just hire somebody and throw a sign up. Yeah. Well, well put, very well put. I mean, a lot of that, you know, my kind of, you know, last question here that I usually, you know, will ask folks, a lot of that is, is advice for real estate agents, and I think, uh, brokers as well. But, you know, are there any other business aspects that, you know, if you're working with, I mean, agents that work for you or agents at other firms, or anyone who's trying to build or enterprise their business, I think it's amazing how, quickly you've flourished at different points, you know, through your career, you know, what advice, you know, would you give to any of them or what advice would you kind of give to your former self with, uh, you so, know, you know, we have something. people that, you know, contact you all the time that want to work with you and want to get into real estate. And uh, it's always the same answers. Well, I love real estate. I love houses and I love people. Um, I honestly don't give a shit about it. I like houses, but it's not like, you know, I watched HGTV every night. Um, I sell an asset that makes me money and I enjoy the process and I enjoy how I've made it creative. Um, but I, I often think that's like somebody calling me and saying, I want to go into the restaurant business. Okay. Well, that's a pretty broad industry. And I think real estate is broad too. Like what kind of restaurant do you want to be? Are you going to be uh, a hot dog stand on, on, on fifth street, or are you going to be a fine dining? And, you know, you know, do you have a specific background that makes you uniquely positioned to work with a particular category of inventory or people? Um, you know, look at what your values are of who you are as a broker and then write a business plan and position yourself in the inventory that you want to work in and stick to that inventory. Don't go chasing the crack of selling something in some location 20 miles away just because you want a listing. Stick to your model of what you sell and become an expert in that space. Um, you know, have a plan. And then so when people do talk about you, they can describe who you are and what you do. Um, don't just be... If you're going in the restaurant business, you wouldn't just set up a lemonade stand on the corner one day and I'm going to do tacos tomorrow and I'm going to experiment with selling some hot dogs at a ballpark. You know, I feel <laughs> the realtors do a lot. It's just, well, I'll do anything. Yeah. You know, that is probably the best analogy I think I've ever heard in regards to that. And I'm, I'm just laughing so much because I, I do see realtors or brokers or agents or whatever you do that all the time. And uh, it's so funny that, yeah, I mean, I, I've never thought of it like that, but uh, but very, very, you know, very. It's hard to do because if you think about it, like if, if you said, Ben, I'm just going to sell $2 million houses and that's all I'm going to do. And they're going to be in this particular location. Well, the best way to sell those houses is to work in that location, become an expert in that location. And I, I literally built my house, my business sell, doing open houses. At, I mean, when it's raining out, people are like, poor guy. Well, I was making a hundred grand that day when I sold that house. So, um, 
But I watch brokers that think about it. You take a listing that's out of your marketplace, maybe a little bit lower price. Now you're meeting all the buyers. Now that's who you're hanging out with. And you're getting farther and farther away from your ultimate goal of selling what you do sell. So, you know, like a business, be funded properly so that you can exist in the economy of what you've chosen for six to 12 months without getting a paycheck, maybe, but stick to the, the mission of where you're at. And then ultimately, it's like being a tulip bulb farmer. Keep plant those tulip bulbs. And yeah, you don't see anything coming up, but just take care of that soil, that farm. Don't get distracted. And then, you know, one day you wake up and it's like, man, I'm standing in a field of tulip bulbs. Like it yeah. happened. I love it. What, um, I guess in terms of uh, just parting thoughts, parting, you know, parting wisdom, we, we've hit on a lot of good points and I know we're probably only, you know, tip of the iceberg here, but what does, you know, what, what does Terry Sprague's future look like? What does the future of real estate look like for you? What, you know, what are you kind of projecting outward or, you know, looking to next with everything? I think it's going to get easier for me because, um, you know, I, I'm going to be speaking at an event and I know the event um, there's a lot of brokers that say, I want to get into luxury. So what does that really mean? I want to get into selling high end property. I want to make more money. So obviously you get a better, make more money when you sell something high end. Um, my process, for instance, uh, when I interview for a listing, I don't use, I don't own a lockbox. I pre -qual I, if you, reach me through some technology online to make an appointment, you got to call me. doesn't work. I'm going to pre-qualify you. Um, my clients know that I'm going to be at the showing and I'm going to turn on the lights. I'm going to turn on the music. Ben likes country. I found, I heard about that. So Ben walks in and country coffee shop is playing. It's the little details uh, that I'm going to continue to do that uh, other models can't afford to do what I do or, or, you know, put the creativity into the collateral. Um, but mostly I'm going to be at my houses and I'm going to be personally selling them. And um, no, I, no self-checkout. No self-checkout. <laughs> you know I, actually, I think all the changes are good because basically it's just the industry saying, hey, get your shit together, show your value. And, um, you know, with all the technology and all the lead generation and um, people are so easily distracted by all of these easy AI ideas of how your business is going to happen. Ultimately, Ben is going to refer you to me because there was something that he remembered about that transaction. I'll give you a simple story. Uh, I was selling this woman's house recently and we had it had been written up that all electronics, TVs, everything built in. And she had just bought a beautiful framed TV that went over the fire mantle. And she liked that TV. I didn't realize how much she liked that TV. But it came up in a couple of conversations. Well, that TV's gone. And yeah, it's gone. It's gone. And I and I just kind of sensed, man, that TV is bugging her. That is a pee under the mattress. Uh, and so, you know, I, I went on Amazon, found the TV, and I shipped it to her new house in Las Vegas. And she got there and she Beautiful. said, how did you, why did you know that was bugging me? And I said, you know, so the key is listening and imagine that I sell her high end home. I do a perfect delivery process and I do everything perfectly. And then when somebody is asking her about whether she'd refer me that, that little TV, that P under the mattress comes up. So remember all the things that surprise people and, delight people because that's the easiest way to get business is people need to trust you. And honestly, this whole commission thing is kind of ridiculous. I mean, we're talking 2%, 3% people are trying to save. Um, like I said, you could actually self check out and lose two or 3% on the purchase at the store, I guess. Um, it's going to be easy to explain our value. Um, there will be new models that will come out and people can experiment with those, but there'll always be people that want good advice. I mean, look, legal zoom exists, but so do really great attorneys still. I haven't seen the law, the, the legal firm go under. You getting a divorce, you're calling the most badass attorney you've ever known. <laughs> <laughs> so why wouldn't you do that for real estate? It's your biggest asset. Call the most badass broker you know and and make you know maximize the event. Another 
phenomenal analogy. I think that that is a great that is a great way to end it. What a golden nugget too with the TV. That's such a great little just you know pick up there or something that you know you picked up that I could see so many people uh, so many people missing. So uh, we ended up getting a lot of those. I think really you know just golden nuggets and just great stories and fun stories in. And I, I know you have so much more to you know to share and offer. So appreciate everybody. Uh, tuning in. I appreciate, Terry, your time uh, on this episode of Love and Heartbreak, Real Estate Unfiltered. Uh, we'll, be ne- we'll be back next time with some more unfiltered, great stories. We heard some great ones today on the celebrity front and others. Uh, so thank you. If you had fun with this one, please like, share, subscribe, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>